Hey everyone, it's August 8th, 2018. This is episode three of the Glacier National Park series I was doing. This is about going to the Sun Road. We were there on July 26, 2018. Um, what I'm gonna show you right now is I'm gonna show you the map so you can get your bearings real quick and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this trail, or not trail, this road, we basically just drove along the road and stopped at outcrops. So you could get a general feel for the stratigraphy and structure of the geology in the area. Now I made a geologic map like I did for the other two episodes but this was a much larger area. So the geologic map is actually a combination of two seven and a half minute quadrangles. Well part of two made it together. Uh, here it is right here and what you can see is this was a pretty decent long trek so the geology isn't that complex here. Now, I've said this before in the Epic Honey video about how, you know, this is, we're still on that overthrust. This is one large, this is one large nap, okay? But there's very little deformation actually within it. I mean, there's some, you get some thrusting within this big nap and you get a lot of dip alterations as compensations were being made when this stuff is getting moved. Because as you, compress because remember from my thrust uh, demonstration video in the first video about Grinnell Trail when you thrust things together and you do this and you one block goes over another block you know things are going to have to compensate things are going to move you know I mean it's not textbook like this it's going to be more like like this is a map view it's going to do this and as you can see my fingers have to adjust to move things are going to adjust within the rock itself so you'll get minor things and i just still blows my mind though how there's not more of them but it is what it is and what is can be so i want to talk about this book real quick um i do recommend this book it does have some i do have some minor problems with it though i'm not going to show you the inside of the book i don't need a copyright strike here i was actually going to do that but I decided not to. Uh, the biggest thing about this book that has changed is here you see the strat column, okay, uh, of the going to the Sun Road. And at the here you'll see the uh, Helena Formation. In this book, that is referred to as the Saya Formation. Uh, that is a Canadian nomenclature. We have abandoned that here. Uh, the Saya here on, in the States is considered the Helena Formation and part of the Empire Formation. Yeah, if memory serves, it's part of the, the little bit of the Empire is included in that. So that's one thing you got to remember about this. And going back to the geologic map here, you will also see other units. Here's the Strat Column 2. Just for comparison, you'll see other units that we aren't going to visit. Uh, they're just on the map because they're on the high points of the mountains, which we didn't go to. We just stayed along the road, stopped at the uh, stop where we could, and took some measurements. Now, the map here, the, the people that did, this is based off that 1992 map that I showed you earlier. And the thing about that 1992 map is it's really accurate. When I was out there taking my measurements, uh, my button wasn't set properly, but I did compensate for that. This is the field book that I used to take my notes. And when I wrote down my strikes and dips, I realized it was still set for the Upper Peninsula. And uh, this is the first, this is Apicuni here. This is the first page of going to the Sun Road. And you can see that I mentioned it in my notes. Later, I went to the NOAA website, figured out what I needed to compensate for, and then I went back, and you can see I circled, all the circled strike and dips are the corrected ones. And the corrected ones are what you see on the map, the geologic map I made. And I discovered something very interesting while doing this. This is how we confirm things. Now, when I was out there, my strike and dips weren't that different from theirs. We were really close within margins, within a reasonable margin of error. So this is a way to confirm the work somebody else had done. So the strike and dips I took confirmed 
the strike and dips they took. So now I have data and facts, right? And that's used to draw the map. So I know their map is reliable. However, here, this map, the one that I did, I did notice a couple of things that they didn't do on their map. If you look here, you'll see this thrust. This thrust I added with a question mark because I'm not sure it was, I didn't see the actual thrust, but I did see the strike and dip of the beds change a lot, okay? They, they kind of curved around a little, as you can see here, which indicates that there might've been a covered thrust fault. They did not have that on their 1992 map, um, but they also didn't stop there. There's no measurement there on their 1992 map. They just passed it up. So I've got more data to add to their map. Something else I think they might have noticed, and we're going to stop at this stop here in the video, but I don't think they added it because it wasn't uh, mappable. Now, the, the, when we make geologic maps, the mappability of a unit is important. Uh, that's the whole concept behind a formation. A formation has to be mappable at uh, a decent scale. And we usually use the seven and a half minute, uh, one to 24,000 scale. We keep that in our heads as our guide to, for doing that. Well, this part of the lower limestone here, which I'm still gonna t you know, talk about that when I, when I get into the video here, um, it was at the leading end of, of a thrust that they mapped but they didn't put it on here. And I think that was just because there wasn't enough room to put it, but they did divide Wild Goose Island here into two formations. I didn't go to Wild Goose Island. I'm taking their work for it because I have no reason not to, because everything I've measured that they've measured, it's been, uh, it's been confirmed. So um, it would have been really nice if we could go to that island, but we couldn't. One more thing before I make this intro way too long is that we had already hiked Apicuni Falls in the morning and we were, when I did Grinnell Trail in Apicuni, you can tell I'm winded, um, sucking hair, uh, you know, I, it was hard for us to do that. And when I was talking on the trails, you can tell I'm kind of like out of it a little. So I'm sitting there, I can picture how things are in my head, but it's hard to speak for me. I'm not one of those people who can sit there and be huffing and puffing and be carrying on a conversation. I can't do that very well. But you'll see here going to the Sun Road, we weren't doing that since we were driving everywhere. So I'm a lot more coherent and less rambly than I uh, usually am uh, with the past two videos anyway. But anyway, that's it. L let's get this started. There's some beautiful pictures and falls and stuff, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we turned around and we we're heading back. Uh, we were not able to be at Logan Pass. I'm going to attack this. this is that upper limestone, which is, um, I'm going to go study that in a second. Um, right there, you can see the top of the limestones. That red is probably that brownish red right there. But, uh... Okay, so I've looked at this rock in detail. That's roughly north, you can see up there. The rocks here are almost all pure carbon. That's at least these gray to light gray thin beds are. Now you see the, this brown stuff, it's very argillaceous. Sometimes it's dark brown, almost black, like up there. This is very argillaceous, uh, macritic limestone, but it's still probably dominantly limestone and not shale. But the beds are very uneven, so strike and dip was really hard to get on this. But within a five to 10 degree strike difference, I mean, I mean, I gotta also figure out the actual compensation for strike and dip since I didn't do that before. These beds strike almost due east-west and dip south 
10 to 15 degrees. Now the 10 to 15 degrees isn't gonna change, but you can see why it's difficult <laughs> to get accurate strike and dip. Like this bed's pretty, pretty, pretty flat. This one is not. <laughs> so um, it can be pretty difficult here. But. Slowly walking to the to Sarah at the Falls, but this weathering is awesome. <laughs> Look at this pitted weathering. This is chemical. This is uh, carbonate dissolving out of solution um, through water, through rain, and groundwater movement. I just think that looks really cool. It eats away at the more pure carbonate first. Lunch Creek. So I'm walking up Lunch Creek with Sarah, and this is still the upper limestone. You see right up here where the green break is, right below the red? That's probably the very top of the upper limestone. It separates it from the above formations. And this obviously is where a glacier used to sit. I don't even know if they consider that snowpack glacier anymore. But uh, this would have been the head of a glacier. And we would have come right down Lunch Creek and met up with the bigger ones down there. But that way's almost south. Okay, Sarah wanted to stop here. Um, we're still within that upper limestone, but there's some other stuff here. See, you can still see it's down here and it's still bedding. I'm not crawling down there. But you can see between the last stop and where we are, there's a lot of glacial stuff and alluvial fan deposits here that have fallen down from these cliffs. And it's here too. And what I think they did here is this is clearly an engineered waterfall. But I think the reason why they did this is because this was probably starting to cut down. And since this is all loose, unconsolidated sands and gravels, it was probably coming out of the road. So they just nipped it in the bud and did this. Um, bring the water on top of it. But uh, yeah, that's still the upper limestone down there in place. Now, you start to see down there, it looks a little gray, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's still that limestone. I just noticed this, that creek. I'm pretty sure that's the name of the upper limestone. Probably the creek it was named after. Oh, there's Sarah. There she is. Wow. I see you, Sarah. <laughs> Comes really, the creek comes, follows dip, pretty much. This is the tight curve. This should be east to west. That's pretty interesting. But this isn't the stop. But this is the GPS of that. If you're interested, I'm interested in that. Um, somewhere between here and the last stop, we have left the upper limestone and are in the upper middle slate. And I am going to go over there and take some measurements and get descriptions and all that fun stuff. Okay, there's where we parked. And this is clearly that upper middle slate, or I believe Grinnell uh, slate formation. Because right here, you can see the quartzite, just like we see at the uh, along the trail a couple days ago. And then you've got reddish slates. You've got some ripple marks, not great ones. Slate tends to be laminated. 
quartzite tends to be internally laminated and uneven. Ferrous in some parts, almost white in other parts. And here we have some nice, a little quartzite layer here with some nice ripple marks. Let's see, what else can we find here before I start taking measurements? There's that quartzite, that, see that quartzite up there? It comes down, oh look, there's ripple marks on it. You can see it up there, some nice ones. That, that comes down and goes into the ground. Here's the ripple marks on top of it. So other quartzites, most of it is this red slate which is silty, very silty. Might even be a salt stone. All right, well, I'm gonna take some measurements. Oh, here we have some nice white quartzite, probably about three and a half inches thick, three inches, three and a half, somewhere around there. And you can see some nice herringbone cross beds in it. See that type of thing with these mud class in it, you got here, this is very conducive of fluvial stream deposits, not marine deposits. And, I would be willing to bet that this formation in part or near entirety is actually fluvial stream. But the problem with that, see so more mud class here, is these nice laminated slates, which would have been shales. Now you can get shales, you know, in streams and floodplains. So this might have been a near tidal flat, barely terrestrial deposits. Okay, I want to show this outcrop real quick because that's where I took the original strike and dip from. But here you can see undulating anaclines and synclines a little bit. But it does overall, it's strike and dip is somewhat consistent. Now this rock changes from the previous outcrop and the fact that we have Proto quartzite at the expense of the slate. Um, feldspar in this stuff is about 50% plus or minus. It varies a little. We do still have the white quartzites, but they're not as prominent. There is still slate, but it is also not as prominent. That way is roughly east. That way is roughly west. And you can also see in the proto quartzite there are reduction spots. But there is also hematite, fine to medium grain, like this bed here. And you can still see we still have sedimentary structures on top of this stuff. But you get closer and you can see the gray in the hematite. I don't know if that's going to come out clear, but um, get a GPS for you here real quick, if I can. I don't know if that's going to do it. There it goes. Okay, this is Sunrift Gorge. Now here, we have the transition. I'm gonna go over here first. This is where the transition is, under the tree. We have a transition between that upper middle slate, which is right there, and the lower middle slate, which I'm gonna come back to, but we're gonna go to this one first. Get some measurements and stuff. Okay. Quick geo babble, and then that means they're gonna go to the gorge. The gorge. The gorge. But this is the transition zone between the two middle slates, the upper middle and lower middle. You can see down here. I studied that one. You can see it's still mostly that red color, but there's some green, and this is almost all green. We still had the proto quartzites here, like this, and here it contains some mud class breccia, like here and here and even some green proto quartzites here. But other than that, we lose the white quartzite and we start having shale, the green shale dominate. I guess there's still some little minor lenses of white quartzite, but not much. Most of it is this red, there's this green shale alternating red, but mostly green. However, if you go down over here, I can see further east, from here, we go back 
to red. Now I don't think we're gonna stop at that outcrop. There may be a fault in here somewhere or something, but from here it looks like the strike and dip are the same. And we have some red up there. So I don't, th I think it's just a temporary color change. So I think this is a good place to put the contact between the two slates. I'm gonna go pick up Sarah, we're gonna go to the gorge. See the white quartzite just exist in stringers here. They're practically gone, but let's go to the gorge. I would actually put the contact right on top of this hill, but it is gradational. All right, we're gonna go. What's up there, Sarah? Awesomeness. Sweet. That up there is definitely the upper middle slate. Ooh. Wow. That's nice. I think this was mentioned in the book as a slight geologic dilemma. I don't see how. Could have just been an eroded fracture. It's gonna detach a little. I mean, we're glaciers here. I'll have to double check and see if it was. This obviously can put here, but that's what's going on. It might end up being a problem. I don't know. I mean, like we see in the UP, yeah. it's the same, same rock type. That's about northish. This should still be the lower middle slate, which is the Apicunny. I think that's how you pronounce it formation, now that I bothered looking it up. <laughs> but um, I did notice that between the last stop and here, we start to get, there was some tight, small tectonic features. And I'm gonna see if they're here. Yeah, it's definitely the Apicunny. That's not quartzite, that white. See it's veined, how it comes down. Uh, where is it? I don't know if you can see it. It's actually white quartz fracture fill. I've seen it on detached blocks. Uh, let's see. Probably going to take some measurements here. Around where I can find a good place to take strike and dip. Let's see. Lithologically, the red's all but gone. There's like no red left. That up there is white quartzite fracture vein fill but there is a whitish bed up there it looks like there's only pink and reds left where there's weathering otherwise it looks like it's just about all green and i'm still seeing some quartzite or proto quartzites but not much like the thicker beds or proto quartzites uh, let's see let's just do it right here that orange that orange pouch is 10 inches wide, but you can see it's pretty consistent in dip and strike and dip. Except right over here seems to be some minor undulating structures. That seems to be common in this area. And I'm gonna go back across. Here you can still see the, there's a lot of proto quartzite stone slates, but here you can see a point fracture from where this rock jointed. Or whatever rock was here, it's now gone. Just point shattered and caused that to face off. So I think it's kind of cool. Maybe I can get some quartzite over here and closer. Yeah, see the red is all but gone and it seems to be just on weathering surfaces. But here's the green proto quartzite. As close as I can get it. With slates and more proto quartzite above and below and interbedded. Okay, right here we are at or very near the contact of the basal yellow limestone, which you can see through the trees here. It's kind of there. It's a little west. And, there, and the overlying green middle slate. This is the bot this should be the very base of the slate. Now, it's a little com somewhat confusing here because the limestone is dipping that way 
so we would think we would see it here my guess is there's probably a fault in here so this may not be truly the base of the slate but um I, everything's covered i can't really tell but that yellow down there is clearly the base of limestone okay this is the wild goose overlook now we are unquestionably in that base of limestone now and As you can see, it's distinctly differently colored. It's gray. I'm looking about north. It's up there. Um, I'm going to go here because I think there's a subtle structure here. Actually, where you just saw that GPS, about a mile west of here, three quarters to about a full mile, was where we first start seeing the limestone and no more slate. So it's the contact is probably over there, but there probably are minor faults here. Let's see if we can get up here. Take a look. That way's north. I'm not going to spend too much time here because it's thundering. I don't know if you heard it or not. From this point forward, we are not going to do any more stop to the lower limestone since we saw it at the falls first thing this morning but we're still driving through it we'll be driving through it until we hit the uh lewis overthrust fault and then we're driving on top of mesozoic this is all lower limestone there's the boats what's the name of this lake i even know I think it was still saint mary's lake. oh yeah saint mary's lake and now all we see is a limestone Fun on the boats and the thunder and lightning.